there we go. So we have a manufacturer of lighting fixtures has a daily production cost of 800 minus 80x plus 0.25x squared, where C is the total cost in the dollars and X is the number of units produced. So it says how many fixtures should be produced each day to yield a minimum cost. So the minimum we know is going to be the vertex because this is a quadratic, right? Um, and since it has a positive 0.25x squared in front, that means it's going to open upward as a parabola, which means if it's opening upward, it does have that bottom point, right? The vertex is at the bottom, and so it makes that minimum. But notice that it only wants me to tell them how many fixtures will give me this minimum, okay? And fixtures is the x value. So the only thing they want here is the x value of the vertex, and that's it. And that's nice because we know how to find that. It's the negative V over 2A business, right? So let me write down this function here for cost. And then we'll do that negative V over 2A. So they just want the X value of the vertex, which is this guy, okay? And so then what is B in this problem? Mm -hmm. The number in front of X, right? And what number is that one? negative 80. So you have a double negative then, right? Don't forget that. The negative from the formula and then the negative from the, v, the B value as well. And then two times A, what is the A? Mm -hmm. It's whatever's in front of X squared, which in this case is a positive 0.25, right? So when we do that, we're gonna get 80 over 0.5, which is gonna be 160. So it's 160 units that they need to find. Um, let me go see if that's an option. It is, it is a. Okay, so let's keep going. Can't remember how many are on here. I think it's 50 something, 55 of them. So we made it almost about halfway last time. So that's good. Um, this one says find the standard form of the quadratic function. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so you can see those choices. So it is a parabola, so it will be a squared x squared function, right? But normally the parabola starts at the origin and then goes upward, right? And this one is still going upward. So there shouldn't be a negative in front. The negative would only make it go downward, right? So this C is obviously not it because it has that negative. And we know since ours is opening upward, it should have a positive number in front. OK, but we can see that the vertex here is now at the X value of negative two and the Y value of negative three. So when you move something to the left, what happens inside the square? Is it plus two or minus two? Mm -hmm. When it goes to the left, it's going to be plus two. So now I know I'm between option A and option D. OK. And then the next thing is, is it also moved downward. So that happens outside the square. And since it's downward, is it plus three or minus three? It's minus three. But unfortunately, both A and D have the minus three, don't they? The only thing different between the two is that the A value is different. And so how do I know which A value to choose, okay? Um, again, on the final exam, you do not need to show your work, right? So we can, explore other methods than the long algebraic method to figure this out, okay? My suggestion is to find a point and plug in the X value of that point and see if you get the same Y value, okay? So for me, I like to plug in zero for X, right? And so that point is right here, zero for X and negative one for Y, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna plug zero into this function and see if I get negative one for Y. And then I'll also check this one as well, plug zero in for X and see if I get a negative one for Y, okay? So for here, if I plug in zero for X squared, I'm gonna get two squared, which is four. And then if I minus three, I get a positive one, not the negative one, right? But if I go to check choice D, if I plug a zero in here, I'll get four after I square it, but then what's half of four? just two and then two minus three does give me that negative one y value, okay? 
And so for here, if I'm trying to choose between A and D, we're gonna go with D, okay? Because that one will give me this correct point here, okay? I could have done it with any point. I could have chosen, well, I don't know what to pick there because it's not exactly in the middle, but if you can find a point like one, one, that also matches, right? This one's just easier to identify, okay? So that's why I chose that one. I'll figure out what I'm gonna write on this paper <laughs> before I submit it, because we just talked it out. Okay, this one says write the function in standard form. So this one I do need to write down a little bit because there is a whole process. The other way to do it is if you'd actually expand all of these problems and then just find the one that after you combine like terms gives you the what the f of x is right that's the way to go backwards right to just check your answers i have been not letting you check answers this entire time right but on the final i told you i don't care what you're doing just select the right answers please <laughs> okay so you can do that backwards um logic if you want on the test okay on the final as like again i've tortured you enough <laughs> with making you do it all full blown. So we're good now. Okay. I know you know how to do it. So you'll be okay. So for me, I'm going to do it the old way. Okay. I'm not going to check all the little answers. I'll let you try to do that if you want to do that. But this in order for me to make it look like this, which is that standard form they're talking about, I have to do what's completing the square. We learned that at the very, very, very beginning of the semester. Okay. So I know it's going to be a little bit to bring it back. Okay. But the first thing you do is whatever the A is here, you have to factor it out, okay? So this is a negative one, which means I have to factor that negative one out just from the first two terms. So I know a negative times a positive X squared will give me a negative X squared, and a negative times a negative eight X, when I multiply those, will give me that positive eight, okay? I'm just bringing this other minus eight down, okay? I did not factor the negative from that one. I don't want to, right? I want this number kicked out on the outside, okay? Then to actually complete the square, you're going to add a certain number and subtract that number inside this parentheses. And what number is that? It's negative B, it's not even negative. It's just B over two squared. That's what I need to add and subtract right here, okay? And so B in this case is a negative eight, isn't it? So I'm gonna take negative eight over two and I'm gonna square that, which is a negative four squared, which gives me a positive 16. So I'm gonna add a 16 and then I'm gonna subtract a 16, okay? Now I only want the positive one in there. I do not want the negative one in there. So what you do is you distribute the negative one to the negative 16 and it'll kick it outside the parentheses. So I have the negative one there because it still needs to get multiplied by these three guys. But when I multiply that guy, it's gonna turn it into a positive 16 outside, isn't it? Okay. And then the inside of here, I can factor. So I know X minus four times X minus four will multiply to give me a positive 16, but combine to give me that negative eight. And then these two I can put together and I just get positive eight. And then the last thing you do is just write this with the square because they're two of the same and you have it in that standard form, okay? And so if I go to my choices, I hope to find that one in there, let's see. Um, a negative and then X minus four and then plus eight. So I think it's E is the one I've got. So do you have to write that one in the front? No, right? So they didn't write that, it's just E. Okay, we saw this one, it did pop up somewhere. So they're bringing it back and they're bringing it back on purpose because it's the first thing you're gonna see when you take Cal one. Okay, I know you got a whole course to take before you get to Cal 1, but that's literally the first thing you're going to see in Cal 1 again. Okay. I am going to need another page for that one. That one's kind of long. Okay. 
So let's see, we have add x equal to 5x minus x squared. And then they want me to find this expression. And then of course it says h cannot equal zero, just so that you know you're not gonna get something undefined. Um, So here's the problem and then what they're asking me to figure out. So before I can figure that out, I actually need to figure out these two pieces so that I know what to plug in in their place, okay? So the first one is a smaller one, f of six. That one's easy to figure out, right? You're just plugging in six into your function. So you plug in a six for x and then you plug in a six for the other x. So I get 30 minus 36, which is negative six. Then you need to find f of six plus h. Now, although this looks more complicated, you're doing the exact same thing. You're just replacing both of those x's with the six plus h. So it becomes five, six plus h minus six plus h squared, okay? Now this one, I definitely wanna simplify before I go plug it in there, okay? So we're gonna distribute that five so it will become 30 and then plus 5h. And then here I'm gonna actually FOIL this out. So imagine like there's another one, right? No more square. There's two of them and then you start FOILing them out. So I'll have 36 plus 6h plus 6h plus h squared. Then I need to take that negative because that negative applied to that whole product, right? So I need to take this negative and distribute it in. So I end up with 30 plus 5h minus 36 minus 6h minus 6h and minus h squared. And then we can combine, of course, whatever like terms we have. So if I do my constants, that's negative six. If I put together all the h's, what is that gonna be? Plus the five, negative seven H and then minus the H squared. Good. Okay, so now when I try to figure out this thing, the whole thing, right? I'm basically gonna plug in what I got for F of six plus H and then I'm gonna minus what I got for F of six, okay? And I'm gonna put that all over an H. So this thing is gonna go here for f of six plus h. And then here, I'm gonna get the answer that I got for f of six. Now I don't need these parentheses because there's no number in the front and there's no exponent, right? To distribute or multiply out. So I can drop those parentheses. And then here, the negative times the negative will get rid of that parentheses. And so I get positive six. These guys are gonna wipe each other out. So I'm gonna end up with negative seven H minus H squared over H. And then depending on how you do the problem, some people factor out the H in the numerator and then cancel it. And some people split the fraction and then cancel out both H's, okay? So there's really two ways to go from here. The first way is to factor out an H. So it'll become negative seven minus H. And then this guy will cancel with that guy, leaving you with just negative seven minus H, right? That's one way to do it. The other way is just to take negative seven H over H and negative H squared over H and then reduce them individually, okay? And so then here, those would cancel giving me negative seven this will cancel the extra one, just giving me the minus H, okay? So there are two ways to simplify that, but both of them gave me the same answer, right? So we do now know the answer for this one. When you get to calculus, you're gonna, even in pre-cal, you're gonna erase a lot. I suggest you buy this eraser. Awesome. I don't know why it works, but it works better than like every other eraser. 
And if you use those little pink ones, they like leave pink all over your paper. <laughs> These don't do that. So they're really cool. I love them. Um, that one would be D because D has negative H minus seven, which is equivalent to what we had, right? We just had them swapped the other way around. Okay. So I'm going to put D. Okay, let's look at 29. I can fit 29 in here. So 29 has a function and then it's asking you to find the average rate of change between these two points. from x1 equal to one to x2 equal to five, okay? Now, the biggest thing that you need to remember for this one is that average rate of change, all of this just means the slope, okay? That's what that means. Average rate of change just means the slope. So you're gonna use your slope formula, which is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, okay? Now we were given x2 and x1. x2 is five and x1 is one, right? But we weren't given the y values. How do you find the y values if they're not given to you? Just plug in those x's, right? So if you wanna find y2, you're gonna plug x2 into your function. And if you wanna find y1, you're gonna plug in x1 into your function. Okay, now I'm writing that because I don't want to write the next step real long. So this is letting you know what I'm going to do, and then I'm just going to write the answer in there. Okay, so let's go to that first one and plug in x2, which is 5. So 5 squared plus 18 times 5 minus 4, and I get 111. Then I'm going to plug in the x1, which is a 1. And I'm just going to go in and change all the fives to ones. And there it goes. And I get 15. So then I'll do this minus 15. Oops, not, not right. There we go. So we get 96 over 4. And that turns out to be 24. Okay. And so this is your average rate of change. Let's go see if that was an option. I'll come back to this in case you're still writing. Ah, uh, yes, it's A, right? That's positive 24, okay? Let me get A for that. That does not look like an A, that looks weird. That's a tiny bit better. Okay, we are on 30 now, making our way. Do you get a note sheet on the final? Okay. Do you know any details about that note sheet? Front page of one page only. And please don't get clever on me. It's a one regular 11 by eight inch piece of paper. <laughs> I've had people surprise me, I'll tell you. Um, I've even had someone get all these pages because I'd upload them, right? And they screenshotted them all. And then they had all of them in little squares like this, each page. And they fit all of them on there. And then um, this lady brought in a magnifying glass. It was, <laughs> it was amazing. I was like, oh, you didn't break any rules, so I'm good with it, but it was fun. <laughs> I was like, that's not really what I wanted you to do. I wanted you to go through the review and the problems that stuck out to you. Like, I would not know what to do with this problem. That's the one you write down. <laughs> but they just took them all and put them all in there. I was like, okay, you do what you got to do. The only reason I don't suggest that is because there's 50 something problems. You're going to sit there and be searching through 50 problems to find the one that looks like the one on the test, right? It takes a lot of time, okay? But if that's what you want to do, I am okay with it.
just as long as you don't break the rules, just one page, front side only. And it just FYI, because some of you guys do choose to take the test online here. Um, if you do take the, te the final online, the thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna show me that note page during the environment check. So they go through the environment check where you're supposed to like show the room and all of that, right? That's when you're gonna show me the front side of your note page and then the back side of your note page, just so I know it's front side only, okay? And then you're good because I can screenshot that and load to see to make sure it's all good. Um, so that's it. That's how you'll work on that. And I'll put a little note, but a lot of people don't read. They just don't. I'm a guilty of it too sometimes. So I'll put in a little note that says, make sure you show your note sheet, but whether somebody reads it or not, I don't know. So <laughs> I'll just make it a point to remind everyone it, when they take the test, if they take it online, to be sure to show it during their environment check. Okay, so let's see, number 30. We've got this function here and it's asking us to find the inverse. So I actually need to write down the steps to do that, okay? And then we'll come back and check to see which one of these is right. I think I think it's D, but let's go check first. Okay. So the first step is to write Y instead of, and I put F of X because that's normally the regular notation, F notation, right? But the, here they called it G of X. It doesn't matter. It's just don't write this function notation, just write a Y, okay? No function notation. Then the next thing you do is you swap X and Y. So all the X's, if there's a bunch of X's, they all become Y's, okay? And then the Y will become an X. But I only have one X, so that's the only one that's gonna turn into a Y. Then you solve for Y. And then the last step is to write the inverse notation instead of the Y. Okay. It became an inverse right here. As soon as you swap those X's and Y's, it was no longer G, it was now G inverse, okay? So people are like, well, how come it was F and then all of a sudden it's the inverse? As soon as you swap those letters, that's what made it the inverse, okay? So I'm gonna solve this for Y. First thing I have to do is get rid of that five. So I have X plus five <laughs> equal to Y to the eighth. And then how would I get rid of an eighth power? Mm -hmm. Take the root, but the eighth root, right? So whatever that power is, that's what kind of root I need to take. And then do the same thing on the other side. So I am going to switch this equ um, equality. So this one's going to go over here and that one's going to go over there. Okay. It doesn't matter. They're equal, right? But the eight root and the eight power do cancel each other. So I am just going to have Y. And then this, I cannot really simplify. So I'm just going to leave it alone the way it is. And then the last thing I do is write, it wasn't F, it was G, right? So I'm going to write G inverse of X equal to all of this. And I think that was D, but I'll go make sure just in case. Sometimes we, I did it in my head when I saw that, I thought, well, if I have to solve, I'm gonna have to add the five and then take the eight root, right? So sometimes you can look at it and know what it's gonna end up looking like, okay? Okay, let me go see if that one is D. Yes, that one is the same as mine. Okay, 31 is another one. So that one, if I decipher it, I would have to square it to get rid of the house, right? Then I would have to minus the 36, right? But then I would have to divide by a negative one to get the x squared by itself. And then I'd have to take the square root. I can't do all of that and just be able to look at those and be like, yeah, it's this one. <laughs> that one I do have to write down. It's a little bit longer, okay? So I kind of know what I'm gonna have to do, but it's a little bit harder to visualize what the answer is gonna look like, okay? So we're gonna go follow those same steps, but with this thing. So first is change this function notation to Y. 
then swap the X and Y's, and then solve for the Y. So to get rid of that house first, we're gonna square both sides. So then I have X squared equal to just 36 minus Y squared because the house and the square cancel out. Then I have to minus 36 to get negative Y squared by itself. But then I have to divide by a negative one in order to just get Y squared by itself. So that means the X squared will turn negative and the 36 will turn positive. And then to get rid of the square, we do the same kind of root, right? And so then I'm gonna swap these. That will undo it. It will have Y all by itself. And here I will have the square root of negative X squared plus 36. I'm gonna change this back to function inverse notation, but I am gonna clean this up. Do you have to write the two when it's a square root? No. And then I notice that the choices don't have them in this order. They have the positive 36 in the front and the minus X squared in the back. Okay. And so we'll go see which one of those matches because I do not remember. So like we could see what we were going to do, but just how that was going to play out, I couldn't imagine. So I had to do it on paper. Um, 36 minus x squared. So that would be a then. Because there's a minus sign. If there were, if these were just 36 times x squared, I could take the square root and say it was 6x, right? But when there's a plus or the minus in the middle, you can't do that. There's no rule. There's a rule that says this, like that, right? But there is no such rule that has a plus or a minus in the middle and it tells you what it equals, okay? There's no rule for that. That's a big one. So when you go to pre-calc, please don't try to take the square root of a sum or a difference, okay? It still happens in pre-calc. Shoot, it still happens in calculus. I'm like, you didn't scream at your kids loud enough for them to <laughs> not do that. <laughs> I always tell my students, if you learn anything, learn not to do that, okay? And then this one, if you have this, it does not mean x squared plus b squared, right? You can't do that. It means you have to foil this out and there's three terms, okay? Those are the two biggies in algebra. No one in my class still does this. I think there were a few of you that did that at the beginning, but no one still does that anymore. So that's a win for me <laughs> in my book. Okay, let's see, 32. So this one, oh, these are nice because they're real easy. You just look at them and then you can decide. Now I am gonna put like the info that you would put on a note sheet. Um, but normally you should be able to look at this and just know what it looks like, okay? So it's asking about end behavior. So when you look at that, you need to look at the leading coefficient or actually not just the coefficient, but the whole leading term, okay? And then you're going to determine which of these four cases there are. So case one is if you have a positive coefficient and then an X to the even exponent. If you have that situation, it does this on the ends, okay? Case two, is going to be if you have a negative coefficient, but then an X to the even still. That means the parabola is not gonna go downward, right? Like if you think of a square for an even exponent, right? Then you have case three, which is if you have a positive coefficient again, but now your exponent is odd. A common odd exponent is a cube. 
and cubes go down over here on this side and up over here on that side. And then finally, the last case, um, and that's if you have a negative coefficient, but still an odd exponent. This one's gonna go backwards from this. So instead of down on the left, it's gonna go up on the left and then down on the right. And so what is our leading term here? It is not the leading term, that is misleading. It's gonna trick you like that. How do you know who's the leading term? It's the term with the highest exponent of x, okay? So does three even have an x? So that's definitely not it, right? <laughs> now, what about, or I shouldn't say x, I should say of the variable, because is it an x here? Is not an x, is it? The variable is not x. What is the variable here? T, okay? So I just made that more general and just said the variable. So who's got the highest power on that T? Mm -hmm, the last term, negative six T cubed. So this is the same form as a negative coefficient, an odd or an even exponent? An odd exponent. And so that actually fits case four. Okay. And so in case four, what is it doing on the left-hand side? Is it rising or falling? Uh -huh. So this one rises to the left. And then what is it doing on the right-hand side? Mm -hmm. And then falls to the right. And so we'll go look for our, through our choices and see which one of those has this information in it, okay? So rises to the left and falls to the right. That would be C. Oops, I didn't mean to highlight that one, but that would be this one. Although E is correct, it's not telling you the right hand and the left hand behavior, is it? Okay. And the problem did say to select the description of the right hand and left hand behavior. And it was just totally missing some stuff, isn't it? Okay. Okay, number 33, we've got this function here. So it says, find all zeros of the polynomial and determine the multiplicity of each. I had a bunch of people guessing on this on the test because this problem was very similar to the one on the test. Um, but people were just guessing. And I said, there's a way for you to know that that's the answer, okay? All you had to do was factor this thing. Once you have it all factored, you get the zeros and you get the multiplicities real easy, okay? So if I'm gonna factor this, do they have something all in common? X squared. And so when I factor that out, I need another X squared to make X to the fourth. And then I need a 14 X to make this guy. And then I just need a 45 to make the last term, right? Just double check that if you distribute this, you do get the original three things. That's how you check that answer. Then you'll factor this thing. And so what factors multiply to give you 45, but add to give you 14? Can you think of them? Five and nine, yes, you got it. Or nine and five, same thing, yes. So I'm gonna do X and what signs would they have to have? Both plus, good. So that they can give me a positive and they add to give me a positive, right? Good. So then now here's where you figure everything out. See this exponent? That tells you the multiplicity. And then these numbers, if you set them all equal to zero, each factor, those give you the actual zeros, okay? So if I set that one equal to zero, I get X equal just to zero. If I set this one equal to zero, I get X equals negative five. And if I set the last one equal to zero, I get X equals negative nine. But this one has a multiplicity of two because that's the exponent, right? This one has a multiplicity of one because that's his invisible exponent. 
And then this one has a multiplicity of one because of his invisible exponent, okay? And so you have everything there. Even if you had just written this, this would have been enough for me to know that you knew how to get the zeros and the multiplicities on the test, okay? But some people just didn't think to factor it at all. And it's okay, but now you know, right? Okay, let's see what number 34 is gonna look like. I'm not gonna fit 34 on here. Okay, I have a question. What do you prefer? Do you prefer me to take the information on this test and write it down and work them out live? Or would you prefer for me to just talk about the problem and then go over to the problem already worked out and explain what's worked out? What do you want me to do? I'll give you an example. Like this problem here, the next one, it says find the polynomial function with real coefficients and it gives you these two zeros, right? I already have the problem worked out. I have all these problems worked out. Um, I did it so that I wouldn't make any more errors because I was making errors yesterday, right? <laughs> and I wanted to make sure we weren't doing that anymore. But I have the problem all worked out. So would you rather me start it off from scratch and do it live? Or would you rather me just explain what I've done here? It'll go faster if I just explain because I don't have to write and you don't have to like take a lot of time to copy and all of that. Um, I do post these so you can go back and look at them later. Okay, so for this one, it wanted us to write the polynomial, but it only gave us these two guys, right? It gave us six comma two plus I, right? But we know that when we're doing um, real coefficients, right, that you need to have a conjugate of this guy in order to make everybody real and so that there's no more imaginaries. Okay, so if you have two plus i, then you're also going to have two minus i as a zero. So I have three zeros here. Okay, so then when you put them in, you're going to do x minus the first zero, x minus these two guys. So notice that they both turn negative, right? And then x minus these two guys. So this one turned negative, but this one turned positive, right? because I'm subtracting both, okay? And then from there, I just distributed everything. So I had to take this X and multiply it by all three of these guys, and then the negative two times all three, and then the negative I times all three, okay? So I'm gonna talk this out. So X and X is the X squared. X minus two is this term here x times positive i is positive ix, right? Then when we move on to the middle guy, we multiply those two, we get negative 2x. Multiply these guys, we get positive 4. And then multiply these guys, we get negative 2i. And then finally, you can multiply the negative i. So times the x is negative ix, times the negative 2 actually makes positive 2i. And then negative i times positive i is negative i squared, okay? Now I tried to combine my like terms. So I noticed that the i positive ix and the negative ix canceled out. I also noticed that the negative 2i and the positive 2i canceled out, okay? But I only have one x squared guy and I do have negative 2x and negative 2x here. So that made negative 4x. Then I also had this plus four right? And then I also had minus i squared. So I wrote down the minus, but i squared is equal to negative one, right? So I put a negative one there instead of the i squared. Then these two guys actually become a plus then, don't they? So it's actually four plus one, which is where this five came from, okay? Now that all the i's are out of the situation, now you're just distributing this thing inside, okay? So the X times all three of these guys, which gives me X cubed minus four X squared plus five X. Then we do the negative six times all three and we get negative six X squared, positive 24 X and then negative 30. And then it's just a matter of combining your like terms. So like these two guys can combine 
and these two values can combine, right? And so that's where we ended up with this result. And that result happens to match the option C, okay? I won't talk about this one, go read the problem first and then, and then we'll look at number 35, okay? But the key thing is to remember, if you do have I's, you also have the conjugates, okay? And C is the one that matches. It has a negative 10x squared, but it has the positive 29 and then a negative 30. Okay, 35 says that if X equals negative four is a root of this equation there, it says use synthetic division to factor the polynomial completely and list all the real solutions of the equation, okay? This is a cubic, um, and so then they want us to factor this cubic. Now, this is a weird problem because this one can actually be done without having to do what it says to do. We know how to factor things with four terms. You use the grouping method, right? I could factor that using the grouping method. No one would know, but I followed the directions in my paper, <laughs> and I did what they were wanting me to do because it does say use synthetic division, doesn't it? I mean, the computer's not going to know whether you did it or not, but um, I'm going to follow the directions. So if negative four is a quote unquote zero, then I should be able to get a zero as the remainder when I do the synthetic division. And so it was one X cubed, positive five X squared, negative 16 X, and then a negative 80. Okay. And nobody was missing. So I didn't need to fill in any zeros or anything like that. So then the process is, is you bring down the first number and then you multiply these two guys and the result goes in the box, right? Then you combine these. So five plus a negative four is one. Then you multiply these guys and you put the results in there. Negative six plus negative four is a negative 20. You multiply those guys, you get positive 80. Negative 80 plus 80 is where the zero came from, okay? So you always add or subtract this way going to the signs. Whatever the signs say to do, that's what you do. Um, then once we have that, remember, this is the zero. So the factor will look like X minus that zero, okay? Which means it's actually an X plus four, right? In that factor. The other factor comes from all these coefficients. So remember, this one is the constant, this one is the X, and this one's the X squared. Okay? So we ended up with positive one X squared, positive one X minus 20. And then we just needed to factor this. And so I figured the numbers would be five and four. And in order for me to get a negative, one's gonna have to be positive and one's gonna have to be negative, right? But if I want my answer to be positive at the end, the bigger number should have been positive, okay? And then you can always double check it. That times that is negative 20 and this plus this is positive one, okay? Once you have it all factored, you set each one equal to zero, right? So this one will give you that negative four, this one will give you a negative five, and then this one will give you a positive four, okay? And then that happened to match um, option E. So 35, X plus five I have, X plus four I have, and X minus four I have. And then they have negative five, negative four and four. So they have them out of order, right? But does it matter? No, because when you multiply, it doesn't matter what order they're in when you multiply, okay? So ours is equivalent to E. This one, you should be able to look at it and just know, but I'll explain it on the paper in a second, okay? Um, but it does want me to determine the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. How do you find vertical asymptotes? Do you remember? Yes, set the denominator equal to zero. That is correct. Um, 
And then how do we figure out whether they have horizontal asymptotes or not? That was a harder one. Yes, you look at those degrees, those exponents, exactly. Okay, so if I take this denominator and I set it equal to zero, what do you get? X equal to what? Positive five, but that's the vertical asymptote, right? So this vertical one should be X equal to five. So I'm that already dims me down to just either A or E, okay? So then I need to know whether the horizontal asymptote is five or whether it's zero. I'm gonna go over to my paper so you can see. So what I've done is I've written a problem, of course. I took the denominator, equaled it to zero, right? And then figured out that the vertical asymptote is x equals five. Over here, I took the degree of the numerator. The highest exponent of x, right? Always the variables. There's no variables up there, are there? So there's no exponents then for x in the numerator. But in the denominator, I do have an x, don't I? And what's his exponent? One, which is why the degree of the denominator is one, okay? Then we notice that this degree is actually smaller, less than this degree, right? And according to the information back in that section, if the top was smaller, then the horizontal asymptote was automatically at zero. If the degree of the numerator is the same, as the degree of the denominator, then the horizontal asymptote is at y equals the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator. And then the last case is if you had the degree of the numerator bigger than the degree of the denominator, that means there's no horizontal asymptote. However, if bigger by one, then you have a slant asymptote. And how do you find slant asymptotes? You have to use long division. Okay. So if you had to have a slant one, I think I do on this problem down here, number 37. Um, but if the numerator degree was bigger by just one, then you have a slant asymptote. And if you want to figure out what it is, you have to go do long division, which we will see in the next problem. So what does 37 say to do? I just wanted you to have all three of these cases because I do not know which one you're going to get on the final, right? So if you have all three of the bits of info, it should be good. Number 37, it just says to select the correct graph of the function. Find all the intercepts and the asymptotes. So I went ahead and did the intercepts first because that was what it said first. So if you wanna find X intercepts, you take your numerator equal to zero. Okay, so I took the x squared minus 9 equal to 0. I added the 9 over, so I got x squared equals 9. And then I took the square root on both sides. But whenever you take the square root, you always get plus or minus, right? So we got x equal to plus or minus 3. I think this might have been enough just to select the correct graph just from the beginning. But I'll, I'll go and show you in a second. Then I tried to do the y-intercept. However, I noticed that when I tried to do the y-intercept, um, you plug in zero for all the x's, but don't we have zero in the denominator? Which means the whole thing's undefined, the whole fraction. And if you have an undefined number, then you can't graph that, right? So there's no y-intercept on this guy. For the vertical asymptote, I took the denominator equal to zero and I just got x equal to zero. I did compare my degrees. What is the exponent on x in the numerator? Two, and what is the exponent on x in the denominator? Just one. And so in this case, my degree of the top was bigger than the degree of my denominator, which according to up there, that meant there was no horizontal asymptote, right? But because it was bigger by just one unit, that meant that I had a slant asymptote. 
And in order for me to figure that out, I had to do the top inside and then the bottom on the outside. And so then I did X, X times X is X squared. When I subtracted those, I ended up with negative nine, but you can't divide. You, if I try to do negative nine divided by X, is that gonna simplify? It's not. And when it doesn't simplify, that means you just stop, okay? And for slant asymptotes, you always ignore this thing, this remainder down here. You just completely ignore it. The slant asymptote is whatever you got up here. That's what goes there, okay? So it's at y equals whatever that quotient was. And so then I put all this information together. I graph the line y equals to x. Um, I graph the vertical asymptote, which is x equal to zero here. I graph the two x-intercepts, the negative three and the positive three. And then if I'm drawing, I honestly have no way to go, but get close to that and then get close to this one, right? And the same thing here, I have nowhere to go, but get close to that and then get close to this one. But I think on this one, if you look at all the choices, as soon as you found those x-intercepts, I think you could have picked the graph because this one doesn't have three and negative three, does it? And then this one doesn't have any x-intercepts. This one doesn't have any. This one has negative three and three. Oh, but you had two. So you would have had to find at least asymptote, right? Because this one has a positive, or I'm sorry, this one has a negative x slant asymptote. And this one has a positive x slant asymptote, okay? So you would have, and if you're too lazy to do the slant asymptote, then you got a 50-50 guess, right? <laughs> Hopefully you choose the right one. I'll show you a quick way to know, right? If you take this divided by that, do you get a positive or a negative? You're positive, right? A positive or positive would be a positive, okay? So it should have been the one with the positive slope, not the one with the negative slope. Okay, 38. So for 38, this is one of those ones where you have to like do all the testing and all of that, right? I think we saw one at the beginning. Kind of bothering me that some of these problems are not in the right order, but anyway. Um, it says solve the inequality. So the first thing I have to do is factor all of this because it does have the equal zero part, right? So that part's good, but I do need to factor it and then set all the factors equal to zero so I can figure out what those key numbers are. And then the key numbers will break up this line, okay? And then depending on which sections work, I might be able to mold two of those sections together, okay? So here's the solution. So the first thing I did is I noticed there were four terms, right? So I grouped them. I cut it in half right there, right here. Then the first half, I factored out the common factor x squared. And so I ended up with just one x and a three. And I have to factor out the minus. Whatever symbol is right there, that's the symbol you have to use, okay? If that's a plus, you have to write plus, okay? Then these two have a nine in common. So I'm gonna factor out the nine. And because that's negative, I'm actually factoring out a negative nine, okay? So this thing divided by negative nine will just be X. And this thing divided by negative nine is where the positive three comes from, okay? You can always multiply that in, make sure that you have the correct um, factors. Then I noticed that the left-hand side and the right-hand side had this X plus three in common. So I factored the X plus three out, but what I'm left with is just this X squared and this minus nine, okay? And then that's a difference of two squares. So I can factor this guy into X plus three and X minus three. And then these two are exactly the same. So I just wrote X plus three squared, right? So if I set this one equal to zero, I get this key number. And if I set this factor equal to zero, I get that key number, okay? And then that's where I broke up my number line. I had negative three and three, and I started testing numbers in each section. So in this section, I chose negative four. In the middle section, I chose zero. And then on the right section, I chose positive four. And so what did I do? I plugged all of those numbers into this equation, right? Or inequality. So I plugged in the negative four for X here and here. I figured out this is gonna be a positive 
but this is going to be a negative, isn't it? And is a negative less than or equal to zero? It is less than. So I put a check mark there and I went ahead and shaded this in. Okay. Then we're going to try the zero next. So I plugged in zero and zero. And after all that computation, I got negative three. Is that less than or equal to zero? <coughs> Excuse me. It is. So I'm going to shade all of this section. And then finally, the last test number is a positive four. And when I computed all of that, I got a positive one, but one is not less than zero, positive one. So this one does not work. So I did not shade this area, okay? Now, this had a bar, didn't it? So that means that this is gonna have a solid dot and this is gonna have a solid dot. So I didn't need to put two separate sections because isn't this solid from here all that way, right? So I only needed to just describe this whole section. So that was from negative three all the way to the three, positive three. And because it is solid, I put a bracket, okay? So you didn't have to break it up. Now, what if this bar was not here? This would have an open and an open, right? And then everything would have parentheses and you would have two separate sections, okay? So pay special attention to whether that bar is there or not. Okay, number 39 is, it's the same direction, solve the inequality, okay? And it's this inequality. So same, same directions. This one though does not have the zero over here like it's supposed to, okay? So when it doesn't have the zero, you gotta move that over. So I went ahead and subtracted it over, right? Then I tried to get a common denominator here so I can just have one giant fraction. So all I did, was take this denominator and multiply it on top and bottom. And then I took this denominator and multiplied it on top and bottom. And what that should do is make it so that both fractions have the same denominator, right? They'll both have x plus four and x plus two. So since they're both gonna have the same denominator, I just put it over one giant denominator. But the first term is gonna be two times x minus two and the second term is gonna be minus one times this x plus four. And so I actually distributed these guys next and I got two x minus four and then negative x minus four. So then I combined my like terms and I got positive x, combined these like terms and I got negative eight. Now that you have it in one giant um, fraction and a zero over there, now you can start getting your critical numbers and your testing and all of that. So here though, you have to set everybody equal to zero. All the factors in the numerator and both of the factors in the denominator, okay? Everybody's gotta get equal to zero. And so that's where these three key numbers came from. The positive eight came from the numerator, negative four and positive two both came from the denominator. So then I drew my number line and I just had to make sure I put them all in the right order, right? So negative four would actually be in the left, positive two would be in the middle, and then the positive eight would be on the, on the right side. So then I have actually four sections now that I have to test, okay? So I'm testing negative five for the section left of negative four. I'm testing zero, which is the number in between negative four and two. I'm testing positive four, which is between two and eight. And then I chose to check 10 on the other side, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm replacing all of these X's with negative five for the first test, okay? So all of those X's became negative fives. I just typed that whole thing in the calculator and it spit out negative 13 over seven. Is this greater than zero? It's a negative, right? And negatives are not greater than zero. So I put an X there and I did not shade that section. Then for the next test region, I'm testing zero. So I'm plugging in zero for all of these X's here, okay? And then once I did all this computation in my calculator, it spat out one. Is one greater than zero? That one is, so I shaded it. Then we plugged in four for all the X's. Again, I put that in the calculator and it gave me negative one fourth. Is negative one fourth greater than zero? 
Negatives are never greater than zero, right? So this one's got another X, so don't shade that. Now I'm gonna plug in the last number, 10, 10, and 10. Type it in your calc, gives me one over 56, but it's positive, right? So is positive greater than zero? Yes, so we check mark that one. So we had two sections that work. Does this have a bar? No bar, which means it should be doing the open dots, right? So I put open dots everywhere and I kind of knew these are separated, right? So I'm gonna have to do two sections anyway, but they would be parentheses because of the open dots. So from negative four to two, and then from eight and onward means eight to infinity, right? And so that one's matched A, but it had the same directions as 38, solve the inequality. So yeah, just solve the inequality and then graph it on the number line. And so this is the one that matches R. We have open dots, but those are the same thing as parentheses, right? And then the closed dots are the same as these guys, the little brackets. Okay, back to something we just finished doing. <laughs> so this would be a little bit easier, right? Because we remember these things. Okay, so the, I fit a whole bunch of them on this page. So sorry if you see stuff that hasn't we haven't gotten to yet. But this one says use the properties to expand um, as a sum, difference, or constant multiple of logarithms. And of course, always assume that the variables are positive. Otherwise, you can't even talk about their logs, right? Because you can only take logs of positive numbers. So let's go see what I did over here. So the first thing I did was separate each term. Since these are all multiplied together, I can separate by taking a log of each one. But then because they're multiplied, I have to put pluses in the middle, right? So when they're multiplied, you separate them by putting pluses. Then the last thing is, is that these exponents can be written as constant multipliers, coefficients, right? So that five in the middle term will come down to the front of the middle term. And so then now it looks like this, okay? And then that one does match one of the choices. It matched choice D, okay? Um, I'll show you what the directions on number 41 look like, but I think that's the one where you had to compress it. You had to write it as a single logarithm because right now it's a bunch of logarithms, right? So let me go look at those directions real quick and then I'll come back to this page. So this one does say condense the expression and write it as a single quantity, okay? So I've written the problem there that they have, that's this one. And then you do the steps backwards. When you're expanding it out, you separate them and then you bring down the exponents, right? When you're going backwards to one term, you gotta put the exponents on there first and then put them where they belong, okay? So the first thing I did was I took this two and I brought it up as an exponent, okay? And then I took this three and I brought that one up as an exponent. This guy didn't have a coefficient, so he didn't change, okay? So I just made those coefficients exponents. Then I went left to right. So I put these two together, but because it was a minus sign, that means division, okay? So it'll be the first term divided by the second one. So it becomes one log there, but it's the first argument divided by the second argument. And I didn't do anything with that one just yet. Then because this one has a plus in the middle, it means I'm gonna take this argument and I'm gonna multiply it by that argument, which is what I've written here, okay? But if you put this one over one and you multiply top times top and bottom times bottom, you end up with just one single fraction, right? And it looks like this one. And so then that actually matched um, option E. Some people do go from here to here. If you can do that, it's totally okay. Again, as long as you're clicking the right answers, I am not too worried about how or why or any of that at this point. The only thing is, is that you still can't use a graphing calculator, even on the final. You can use this one, the one we've been using, right? 
any scientific calculator because I think there's a couple of people that have a different calculator than this one, but as long as it's a scientific one, you're good. Okay, the next ones all say solve all of them. So they just say solve the exponential or solve the logarithm equation. And so the problem was this, okay? Now, the only way that you can solve exponentials is if the exponentials are by themselves first. So the first thing I have to do is get rid of that two, which is why I divided both sides by two, right? After doing that, we get e to the x by itself now, and then just equal to nine. And there's really two ways to do this. I did it by changing it to log form. So I went from exponential to log form. And how do you do that? Um, I don't know what letters they used. I guess it doesn't matter. I care. So remember your base stays the base, the exponent, oh, it's like this. It's C and then an A. There we go. And so then this becomes your argument and then that becomes the C. Okay, the other two guys have to switch sides, right? So I have this exponential. If I wanna use my definition, that means I'm gonna have log with the same base E but the X and the nine are gonna swap sides, okay? So I now have a nine over here on this side and an X on this side of the equal sign. Then this log E, by definition, log E of anything is equal to log LN of that same thing. That's just the definition of what LN was, okay? So log E is LN. I'm still doing the ln of nine and I still have it equal to X. And then you could type this in your calculator, get decimal, but I think there were not very many answers that had log or ln of nine. So if you go here, there's really only one that has ln nine, right? So you would know it's, it's this one, D. Okay, the next two, again, solve the logarithmic and here solve the exponential. So just like the exponentials, if you're solving a log equation and there's just one log, you need to get it by itself, okay? So the first thing I'm doing is I'm moving this five over by minusing five. So I get the two ln of x equal to a negative one. Then I'm dividing by this two so that I can have ln of x all by itself. But then that would make this one negative one half, right? Then from here, I am gonna wanna switch the form over, but in order for me to switch the form over, it can't say LN, it has to say LOE, okay? And then I can switch it over to this one. So because it says LN, I changed it using this definition, just going in this direction now, right? I went from LN to LOG base E of X equal to negative one half, and then I swapped the form. So the base will stay the base, and then these two guys swap sides. So the negative one half is on this side now, and the X is on the other side, okay? And then again, there was only one answer that had E to the negative one half as an option, and that was option D. The last one's a little bit tricky. Um, this one is one of those quadratic forms, okay? How do you know? Whatever this guy is, this one is doubled. So if this is e to the x, and I take e to the x and I square it, that's what the other one is. What happens when you have an exponent raised to an exponent? You multiply them. And so don't I get this exponent raised? Okay. So as long as you have one guy regular and the other guy is squared, this is a quadratic type. Okay. And when it's a quadratic type, you just take whatever this middle term is, not the coefficient, just the middle term. That's what comes over here on the side of your quadratic formula, okay? Even if you had a problem like this, I'm gonna write some weird one, but not that this is gonna be on the test, but I'm just writing it. Okay, notice that the variable term here is square root of x. What happens when you take square root of x and you square it? Do you get that guy? 
So this would also be a quadratic type. And before I do my quadratic formula over here, I'm gonna take whatever that middle term is and put it on the left side of the quadratic formula, okay? Y'all were doing that, but y'all just didn't realize y'all were doing that. You had this. And then you always put an X here and then you did your formula, right? But why did you always put an X here? Because that's what was in the middle, okay? And so when you're doing these quadratic types, you could do the same thing. You just have to remember to put the term in the middle right here, okay? And so I did that. I put the E to the X. I did the whole quadratic formula and I ended up with this after simplifying a little bit and then eventually this and then eventually I got to this, okay? So we plugged in negative three for B, negative three squared, minus four, a one for A, and a negative four for C, all over two times A. These guys gave me positive. I stuck all of that in the calculator and got positive 25, and then that times that is two. We actually could take the square root of 25, it's five. And then three plus five is eight, Eight divided by two is four. Three minus five is a negative two. Divide that by two and you get the negative one. Now you have to remember though, e to the x equals four and e to the x equals negative one, right? That's not x. So we have not solved for x just yet, okay? I have to change the form over. And if you change the form over, you figure out that this is log base e and then the four and the x swap, right? So it's log base e of four equal to x. And same thing with this one. It's log base e and then these guys swap. So it's log base e of negative one equal to x. We know that log base e of four is just ln and log base e of this guy is just ln, right? That's the definition of ln. However, if you try to type ln of negative one in your calculator, it gives you error because you're not supposed to ever have a negative argument, okay? And so because this guy has a negative inside there, this one is not a good answer. So the only answer is the ln of four, okay? So that one's a little bit tricky. It's tricky here because you can do quadratic formula. You just have to use the middle term. But then you have to remember that at the end. And don't think that four and negative one are your answers. Okay. What does this one look like? I'll see. And you see all the LNs anyway. So you kind of know it's going to have to switch forms at some point, right? Okay. Mm, another one. Oh, but these are nice. When there's two logs or two exponentials, those are always a little bit easier. When there's two logs, they usually just go away, don't they? Or when there's two exponentials, the bases just go away, okay? So for that one, um, we just make, basically make these things go away and we only have the arguments equal to each other. And so then I minus 4x on both sides and then I added the three on both sides and I got x equal to seven. There was one like this on the test. I think the answer was like 17 or something on the test. So you did see one of these before. If you notice, a lot of these problems are similar to the ones on your test. I did that on purpose. I put similar problems on your test just so that you could have practice and you'd seen them before, before you saw them on the final, okay? Okay, number 46. Of course, we've seen these as well. A lot of people skip these problems and they were like worth the most on that test. You couldn't even get anything higher than a C if you didn't do those last two problems. Um, Cause they were both like some odd number of points. There were like a lot of points. Um, I need to write, we need to look at that one a little bit more before I go to my paper, okay. Um, but that one and this one, this one was not on the test, but we'll do it. This one was on the test. You remember that number, right? <laughs> that one was on the test. So, and then I think one like this as well. Yeah, I think it's the same problem. I told it to algorithmically generate it, but it looks like it gave me the same exact numbers as the ones on the final, on the test. Okay, 
So for here, this one says complete the table. So we know that our annual rate is 6.93%. And then we even know that the amount after 10 years is this, but they need us to find the initial investment and then they need us to find the time to double, okay? You can do the time to double without even knowing what the investment is. Because even if you don't know it, you would just use P, right, for the investment. And then if you're doubling P, it's 2P, right? And then your first step is going to be to divide by P's, and there's no more P's anyway. So you can do it. You can do this one first if you want to. But I always did this one first, okay? So... First thing I did was, is I wrote the rate as, instead of this percent, I wrote it as a decimal, right? Then I also took that information that they gave me. They said that the amount was this number, $20, when T was 10 years. And so I plugged that into this formula because it does say continuously compounded. I'll show you where it says it. It says it right there. Okay, so since it's continuously compounded, I'm using this formula. So I plugged in the A value that they gave me. I do not know what the events investment is. Here's E, there's my rate, and then there's my T. This is all numbers, right? Isn't E kind of like pi? It is a number, right? It's 2.78 something or another. So I typed all of that in my calculator and just figured out what that number is. And if you're trying to solve for P and it's multiplied by a number, don't you just divide by that number, right? To get the P by itself. So I divided both sides by that long decimal 1.99 something on both sides. And when I did that, I got this on the left-hand side. And then if you round that, it's basically 5,000, right? I think on your test, it was like 4,000. I can't remember, or 16, something like that. There's different numbers though. Now the time to double, I don't need to know what the P is. I mean, I, now that I know, I could have put 5,000 here and then double 5,000 would have been 10,000, right? I could have done that, but I don't need to know what the P is to do the double time. Whatever it is, double means two times that, right? And then if I need to get this exponential all by itself, I'm gonna have to divide by that P anyway. And so then they both in canceling and I have no more P's. So see how important the P's were, right? They just went away, they were all gone. Then from here, I did switch the form over. So I did log base E, and then these two guys switched. So this is not gonna be with the E anymore. Now the two is with the E, okay? And then all of this exponent gets kicked over to the other side, okay? Then I know that log base E just means LN, and if I'm trying to solve for T, I'm going to have to divide by that number in front of T. So I divided that number on both sides. I stuck all of that in my calculator and I got pretty much 10. I'll show you what I get. Um, LN of two over, we get this. So it's like 10.002, which is pretty much 10, right? So that's that. There's a couple more of these exponential thingies.